Visualization is the process of making mental images, and the image is the mold or the model, which will serve as a pattern from which your future will emerge. Make the pattern clear and make it beautiful. Don't be afraid. Make it grand. Remember that no limitation can be placed upon you by anyone but yourself. You are not limited as to cost or material. Draw on the infinite for your supply. Construct it in your imagination. It will have to be there before it will ever appear anywhere else. Make the image clear and clean cut. Hold it firmly in the mind and you will gradually and constantly bring the thing nearer to you. You can be what you will to be. This is another psychological fact which is well known, but unfortunately, reading about it will not bring about any result which you may have in mind. It won't even help you to form the mental image, much less bring it into manifestation. Work is necessary. Labor. Hard mental labor. The kind of effort which so few are willing to put forth. The first step is idealization. It is likewise the most important step because it is the plan on which you are going to build. It must be solid. It must be permanent. The architect, when he plans a 30-story building, has every line and detail pictured in advance. The engineer, when he spans a chasm, first ascertains the strength requirements of a million separate parts. They see the end before a single step is taken. So you are to picture in your mind what you want. You are sowing the seed, but before sowing any seed, you want to know what the harvest is to be. This is idealization. If you are not sure, return to the chair daily until the picture becomes plain. It will gradually unfold. First, the general plan will be dim, but it will take shape. The outline will take form, then the details, and you will gradually develop the power by which you will be enabled to formulate plans which will eventually materialize in the objective world. You will come to know what the future holds for you. Then comes the process of visualization. You must see the picture more and more complete. See the detail. And as the details begin to unfold, the ways and means for bringing it into manifestation will develop. One thing will lead to another. Thought will lead to action. Action will develop methods. Methods will develop friends, and friends will bring about circumstances. And finally, the third step, or materialization, will have been accomplished. We all recognize the universe must have been thought into shape before it could ever have become a material fact. And if we're willing to follow along the lines of the great architect of the universe, we shall find our thoughts taking form just as the universe took concrete form. It's the same mind operating through the individual. There is no difference in kind or quality. The only difference is one of degree. The architect visualizes his buildings. He sees it as he wishes it to be. His thought becomes a plastic mold from which the building will eventually emerge, a high one or a low one, a beautiful one or a plain one. His vision takes form on paper and eventually the necessary material is utilized and the building stands complete. The inventor visualizes his idea in exactly the same manner. For instance, Nikola Tesla, he with the giant intellect, one of the greatest inventors of all ages, the man who has brought forth the most amazing realities, always visualizes his inventions before attempting to work them out. He did not rush to embody them in form and then spend his time in correcting defects. Having first built up the idea in his imagination, he held it there as a mental picture to be reconstructed and improved by his thought. In this way, he writes in The Electrical Experimenter, I am enabled to rapidly develop and perfect a conception without touching anything. When I have gone so far as to embody in the invention every possible improvement I can think of and see no fault anywhere, I put it into concrete, the product of my brain. Invariably, my device works, and as I conceived it should, in 20 years there has not been a single exception. Now, if you can consciously follow these directions, you'll develop faith, the kind of faith that is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. You will develop confidence, the kind of confidence that leads you to endurance and courage. You will develop the power of concentration which will enable you to exclude all thoughts except for the ones which are associated with your purpose. The law is that thought will manifest in form and only one who knows how to be the divine thinker of his own thoughts can ever take a master's place and speak with authority. Clearness and accuracy are obtained only by repeatedly having the image in mind. Each repeated action renders the image more clear and accurate than the preceding, and in proportion to the clearness and accuracy of the image, it will outline toward manifestation. 
You must build it firmly and securely in your mental world, the world within, before it can take form in the world without. And you can build nothing of value, even in the mental world, unless you have the proper material. When you have the material, you can build anything you wish, but make sure of your material. You cannot make broadcloth from shoddy. This material will be brought out by millions of silent mental workers and fashioned into the form of the image which you have in mind. Now think of it. You have over five million of these mental workers ready and in active use. They're called brain cells. Besides this, there's another reserve force of at least an equal number ready to be called into action at the slightest need. Your power to think, then, is almost unlimited. And this means that your power to create the kind of material which is necessary to build for yourself any kind of environment which you desire is practically unlimited. In addition to these millions of mental workers, you have billions of mental workers in the body, every one of which is endowed with sufficient intelligence to understand and act upon any message or suggestion given. These cells are all busy creating and recreating the body, but in addition to this, they are endowed with psychic activity whereby they can attract to themselves the substance necessary for perfect development. They do this by the same law and in the same manner that every form of life attracts to itself the necessary material for growth. The oak, the rose, the lily, they all require certain material for their most perfect expression, and they secure it by silent demand. The law of attraction, the most certain way for you to secure what you require for your most complete development. Make the mental image, make it clear, distinct, perfect, Hold it firmly. The ways and means will develop. Supply will follow. The demand you will be led to do the right thing at the right time and in the right way. Earnest desire will bring about confident expectation, and this in turn must be reinforced by firm demand. These three cannot fail to bring about attainment because the earnest desire is the feeling, the confident expectation is the thought, and the firm demand is the will. And as we've seen, feeling gives vitality to thought, and the will holds it steadily until the law of growth brings it into manifestation. Is it not wonderful that man has such tremendous power within himself, such transcendental faculties concerning which he had no conception? Is it not strange that we have always been taught to look for strength and power without? We've been taught to look everywhere but within. And whenever this power manifested in our lives, we were told that it was something supernatural. There are many who have come to an understanding of this wonderful power and who make more serious and conscientious efforts to realize health, power, and other conditions, and they seem to fail. They don't seem to be able to bring the law into operation. The difficulty in nearly every case is that they're dealing with externals. They want money, power, health, and abundance, but they fail to realize that these are the effects and can come only when the cause is found. Those who will give no attention to the world without will seek only to ascertain the truth. They will look only for wisdom, and they will find that this wisdom will unfold and disclose the source of all power, that it will manifest in thought and purpose, which will create the external conditions desired. This truth will find expression in noble purpose and courageous action. Create ideals only. Give no thought to the external conditions. Make the world within beautiful and opulent, and the world without will express and manifest the condition which you have within. You will come into a realization of your power to create ideals, and these ideals will be projected into the world of effect. For instance, a man is in debt. He will continually be thinking about the debt, concentrating on it, and his thoughts are causes. The result is that he not only fastens the debt closer to him, But he actually creates more debt. He's putting the great law of attraction into operation with the usual and inevitable result. Loss leads to greater loss. So what then is the correct principle? Concentrate on the things you want, not on the things you don't want. Think of abundance. Idealize the methods and plans for putting the law of abundance into operation. Visualize the condition which the law of abundance creates. This will result in manifestation. If the law operates perfectly to bring about poverty, lack, and every form of limitation for those who are continually entertaining thoughts of lack and fear, it will operate with the same certainty to bring about conditions of abundance and opulence for those who entertain thoughts of courage and of power. This is a difficult problem for many. 
We are too anxious. We manifest anxiety, fear, and distress. We want to do something. We want to help. We are like a child who has just planted a seed and every 15 minutes goes and stirs up the earth to see if it's growing. Of course, under such circumstances, the seed will never germinate. Yet this is exactly what many of us do in the mental world. So we must plant the seed and leave it undisturbed. This doesn't mean that we are to sit down and do nothing. By no means. We will do more and better work when we have ever done before. New channels will constantly be provided. New doors will open. All that is necessary is to have an open mind. So be ready to act when the time comes. Thought force is the most powerful means of obtaining knowledge, and if concentrated on any subject will solve the problem. Nothing is beyond the power of human comprehension, but in order to harness thought force and make it do your bidding, work is required. Remember that thought is the fire that creates the steam that turns the wheel of fortune upon which your experiences depend. Now ask yourself a few questions and then reverently await the response. Do you not now and then feel the self with you? Do you assert this self, or do you follow the majority? Remember that majorities are always led, they never lead. It was the majority that fought tooth and nail against the steam engine, the power loom, and every other advance or improvement ever suggested.